Welcome back everyone to another episode of Space This Week. We have lots of space updates for you all today, as well as more progress with SpaceX's Starship program, from propellant loading tests, the Mammoth Falcon Heavy, two Falcon 9 launches, neutron updates, a Titan II booster returns to Cape Canaveral 57 years after it launched, and much, much more. Let's begin with Starship news. Testing is really ramping up down at the launch site area. We have three major vehicles down there right now, Ship 24 and Booster 7, which remain stacked on the orbital launch mount, and Ship 25. Beginning with the former, Booster 7 and Ship 24 have continued undergoing their final round of testing before they make the first Starship orbital flight, which we're hoping will be sometime in late February to March. Last week, on Wednesday, we saw some initial testing of the FireX suppression system on the orbital launch mount, followed by a lot of activity at the orbital tank farm that was then followed by frost lines appearing on both the booster's liquid methane and liquid oxygen tanks. This test didn't turn out to be the wet dress rehearsal that we're all itching to see though, as the tanks weren't completely filled. The frost lines indicate that they were fueled to around a quarter of their full capacity. When we do eventually get a full fueling of Booster 7 and Ship 24, this will be the heaviest load that the orbital launch mount has ever had to support. It's never supported a fully fueled booster with a Starship stacked on top. The most it's ever done was this test of a full booster filling only. Here you can see the cryo testing with Ship 25 in the foreground on the left here. It was moved to the launch site on the 14th of January and it's about to begin its major test campaign which will include pressurization and cryoproofing tests, as well as hopefully some static fires. As the ship currently has all of its Raptor engines installed and it was placed onto suborbital pad B, which is set up to support static fire testing. Things are hopefully going to start getting loud at the launch site. Looking ahead this week, a temporary flight restriction has been placed at the Starbase location by the FAA, which will run from Monday to Tuesday and will cover the surface up to 14,000 feet. So hopefully we'll get some activity very soon after this video goes live. Ship 25 and 24 both had Starlink payload dispensers, but since had their payload bay doors sealed closed, for reasons unknown. However, SpaceX still appear to be building new ships with the Starlink Pez dispensers. Lab Padre Streams just caught this video of a Pez dispenser being loaded into an under construction ship. There have been some big shakeups at the Rocket Garden. Last week, I covered the fact that Ship 22 had some of its thermal protection tiles removed in addition to the removal of its aft flaps. And on Tuesday last week, it was moved into the high bay for final scrapping. In this shot of its move here, you can also see Booster 8 is having some of its components removed, meaning that its days were numbered as well. It too was moved away from the rocket garden and was chopped up for scrap. Over at Cape Canaveral, Spaceflight now caught this footage of the skates for the catch arm carriage being mounted to the launch and integration tower at SpaceX's launch pad at 39A. The arms also appear to have been mounted to the carriage as well, so the Kennedy launch pad should be getting its arms installed any day now. SpaceX didn't just have a busy week with their Starship program, they pulled off a lot of launches as well. The week kicked off with a big one. On the 15th of January, we got to see another Falcon Heavy launch. This was the USS F-67 mission and the first national security payload launch for SpaceX this year. There were two classified military satellites on board for the United States Space Force. All we know is that one of them, the CBAS-2, is designed for military communications and the other, the LDPE-3A, is a technology demonstration payload. Both were sent to geosynchronous Earth orbit and because of the high payload mass and high orbital destination, the Falcon Heavy core for this mission was expended as it was traveling too fast and didn't have enough fuel remaining to attempt a landing. In fact, it's looking unlikely that we'll ever see a center core recovery attempt for Falcon Heavy moving forward. Elon tweeted this week that the center core moves too fast. Full and rapid reusability requires a two-stage rocket, like Starship, but Falcon Heavy is a three-stage rocket. This tweet isn't super clear on this, but this kind of reads that SpaceX aren't planning on any more Falcon Heavy core recoveries. At the end of the day, the Falcon 9 is a very capable rocket. There aren't really that many missions that require a Falcon Heavy, and those that do probably have the budget to cover the center core loss. <laughs> However, SpaceX are still recovering the two side boosters, and last week's launch was no exception. Love me a good side-by-side -side booster touchdown at the landing zone. Check out that footage there. <laughs> 
On Wednesday, while Starship was fueling up, a Falcon 9 was fueling up as well. And then it launched. <laughs> this launch took place from Cape Canaveral and was another United States Space Force payload. Specifically, it was a GPS-3 navigation satellite named the Amelia Earhart, after the pioneering aviator of the same name, who set many aviation records, including becoming the first female aviator to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. The Falcon 9 first stage for this flight was a pretty new booster. This was only its second ever flight, having previously supported the Crew 5 mission. It successfully landed on the drone ship a short fall of Gravitas last week. While that Falcon 9 booster was pretty new, it wasn't as new as the other Falcon 9 booster that we saw launch last week. This was the maiden flight of the brand new booster 1075. This launch took place on Thursday from the Vandenberg launch site, and this was SpaceX's latest Starlink mission, Starlink Group 24, and the rocket carried 51 satellites to orbit. The booster successfully landed on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You shortly after second stage separation, and I look forward to seeing many more flights from this thing. <laughs> yes, three orbital launches for Falcon last week. That's a lot. But SpaceX are going to have to launch a lot if they want to reach their aspiration of 100 orbital launches in 2023. Rooklan creates these great infographics for SpaceX's Falcon, and her latest render here shows us how we're doing. At 5.2% of the way through the year, SpaceX have managed 5% of the launches so far. Now, I am sure that Starship orbital flights will definitely help boost the numbers, but still, this is a tall order. But I know that if anyone can do it, SpaceX definitely can. It has been a while since we last had any major Neutron updates, Rocket Lab's Falcon 9 slash Starship competitor. While its second stage isn't recoverable, it's extremely lightweight and cheap, so this will still be a very cheap and competitive launch option. Rocket Lab CEO Peter Beck shared this picture on Twitter last week, showing some Neutron first stage tank halves being worked on. Neutron is definitely one of the upcoming launch vehicles that I'm really, really looking forward to the most. Falcon 9's first stage has been the only reusable orbital rocket stage for far too long now. To give you an idea of neutron size versus electron, here's a neutron tank dome beside an electron tank dome, with a Buzz Lightyear for scale as well. <laughs> In fact, there's an electron on the pad right now! This should be launching either today or tomorrow, so make sure you're subscribed and have notifications turned on so that you don't miss my coverage of this mission in next Monday's episode of Space This Week. And hey, if you are enjoying today's video, then don't forget to leave a like down below. It really helps me stay on good terms with the almighty algorithm and stuff. <laughs> the Gemini 5 mission, which launched in 1965, was NASA's first ever mission to have a rocket stage recovered intact. Last week, the Cape Canaveral Space Force Museum took delivery of the 8 metre long fuel tank, which formed the upper portion of the Titan II rocket's first stage. Recovery was never planned for this mission, the spent stage crashed into the Atlantic Ocean shortly after stage separation, but by happenstance a US Air Force plane spotted the tank floating in the water. Somewhat flattened from the impact, but still clearly sporting part of the lettering that spelled out United States. This is the only US booster ever recovered, aside from the Space Shuttle SRBs, which were designed to be recovered and reused, and I guess, of course, SpaceX's Falcon 9. Following last week's move, the fuel tank will now be displayed inside Hangar C at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. On Friday, NASA astronaut Nicole Mann, who is the first Native American woman in space, and Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut Koichi Wakata conducted a spacewalk on the International Space Station in order to make preparations for future upgrades to the station's power system. New rollout solar arrays have been added to help bolster the main power channels for the station. I would now like to give a huge thank you to all of the names scrolling on the left of the screen. They're my Patreon members and my YouTube channel members, and it's their generous support that allows me to keep making these space news videos for you every single week. If you want to see your name displayed there, then you can follow the links in the description or via the card on screen. And uh, yeah, there are also some videos on screen as well for my channel that YouTube thinks you'll like. Hopefully they're good picks. But yes, thank you all so much for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you again very soon.